Hello, good morning, everyone. And welcome to the World Affairs Council of Kentucky and Southern Indiana's second Leaders Without Borders meeting. This one is entitled Representation Matters. We are so thrilled to have Dr. Monica Unseld and Ms. Lillian Wachuku from Nigeria to speak on their experiences as minorities in majority spaces. And I would love for each of our esteemed speakers to introduce themselves. So Dr. Unseld, would you like to start us off? Uh, yes, I'm Dr. Monica Unseld. I'm here in Louisville, Kentucky. I am the founder and executive director of Until Justice Data Partners, but my training, um, so I have a doctorate in biology and a master's in public health, I've been working in social justice and environmental justice issues for about 15 years. Happy to be here. Well, thank you so much for being here. And Ms. Wachiku, could you introduce yourself a little bit? My name is Chiwedi uh, Wachiku. I uh, was an educator, a teacher, before I got elected into the House of Assembly as a legislator. And I'm from Ebony State, Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you being here. I know I said good morning when we first started, but it's definitely good afternoon for you. <laughs> so we are so happy that you can make the accommodation to zoom in with us today. Um, so I would love to go ahead and get our discussion started. Um, so kind of our first question is, you know, both of you have really demonstrated strong leadership within your fields. And I was wondering if you could talk with us a little about your leadership style and how you lead others. So Ms. Wachuku, would you like to go first? No problem. Yeah, I would uh, describe my leadership style as a um, very democratic because I allow people contribute on decisions we make and I get everyone involved. So it's a collective responsibility for everyone around me. And uh, I, I make sure that the uh, people working with me are responsible for the outcome of uh, actions and decisions taken. So most often I delegate tasks to, and other times I lead by example to inspire people around me. Thank you so much. I love your discussion of um, really inclusive leadership. I think that's so important and I think your point of leading by example is also really, really important in a leader. Um, Dr. Unseld? Um, actually, I think there, there may be some overlap in our styles. For me, I was a college professor, so I had that student advisor relationship. And with that, I noticed that I'll, many times people have leadership skills, they have talents, they have knowledge and experience and abilities. They just never have the opportunity to show them. So part of it is I kind of say I kind of lead from behind, which but it's maybe I'm actually doing what Lillian was is doing is I'm letting people do the work. So I'm saying you you can do this work. Um, you you have the ability to do this work. So it's not me sort of doing everything and pulling someone with me. I'm saying we're all doing this together and I believe in you. And I think for me, I, I think about leading by example. So I am the descendant of enslaved people. Um, and when we were emancipated, they changed their last name because they didn't want the master, the slave owner's last name anymore. And we heard stories about how we were in Africa. So we were always taught to carry yourself with dignity. Um, because when I was growing up, I never saw a black biologist. Um, and now I, other kids get to see a black biologist in me. But it was because um, by the time I got old enough to realize you know, that people didn't think I could do it, my family were like, no, 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 your ancestors were scientists and astronomers and all of these things. So um, it's sort of bringing that example that we aren't taught here um, in the US about what black people can do. Absolutely, I love that. I was wondering, um, in regards to your leadership experience, what are some benefits that you have received from these experiences? Um, we can start with Dr. Amensel. For me, I love when people realize they can do something. You know, like when you can step back and you see someone start to step into their potential, 
that to me is the most amazing feeling ever. Um, especially because I always say we should never be shocked that someone should achieve, can achieve. We should be shocked that there's a system that made us think they could not achieve. So for me, it's just seeing someone else glow and then I can, I can go take a nap. You know, they got it. <laughs> I love that. Uh, Ms. Nwachuku, what are some benefits you've received from your leadership experiences? I have become a better version of myself by being more confident than I was when I started this um, uh, journey initially. And uh, um, I have learned to relate and manage personalities with different attitudes without having problems with any of them. I have supported other women and many young ones to succeed in their choosing careers through my leadership. So it's been exciting working with different people with different uh, characters and dispositions towards life. I have mentored many young women who are willing to run elections through my leadership uh, style because they are learning from me too. I've also sponsored uh, about three women who are currently counselors in my constituency, and they are all women and one man. Through my leadership experience, my character has developed so much over time. I think I'm better today than I, I was before. Thank you. Can I just say that running for office is so brave. That's so amazing. Um, that's so courageous and so awesome that you're doing that and encourage because I'm just I couldn't I couldn't do it. <laughs> I 100% agree, Dr. Unsell. I could not do it either. Um, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> oh my gosh. You can, um, you can try it's more difficult. <laughs> <laughs> I can stay at my my laptop all day. I don't have to. Make <laughs> oh my gosh. I mean. Both of you really not only spoke about what leadership has meant to you and how it's developed you as a person, but I feel like both of you are really almost being representative to other individuals as well and inspiring younger leaders. And I think that's just amazing. And I love hearing that from both of you. Um, so I guess I'm wondering, since you all are inspiring so many younger leaders to run, who inspired you to be a leader and why did they inspire you to be a leader? And I think Miss Wachuku, I think it's your turn to go first. I didn't get that correctly. So oh, I was sure. So I was wondering who inspired you to be a leader. Oh, okay. <laughs> I grew up in an environment where the girl child education is uh, neglected. An early marriage promoted, but my father stood by me by my sisters and other girl children around us in our community. So he encouraged and supported all of us to go through school. Most young persons looked up onto him for one encouragement or the other, and he was always there for us. He was like, uh, he gave us proper guidance through education. He was a teacher, a village leader, and a mentor. So he was a great role model. I was inspired by his selfless service and leadership style, and I was encouraged to take it up from there. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I think that's a really positive thing to grow up with someone like your father in your corner, the way that he was. So I'm so happy to hear about that. Um, Dr. Unsteld, who inspired you to be a leader? Um, I'm my family as well. Um, so I mean, we were always, so like we, where we live, I'm, we're very much aware. I know where my ancestors were enslaved and, and I know where, who my ancestors were, who owned them. And so that was a very, we talked about that. We grew up knowing that that's part of our history. And then we grew up knowing that, you know, so my grandmothers, they were, how, they were maids, they were in domestic servants because, and, you know, they couldn't, go to school my ancestors they weren't allowed to read they weren't allowed to go to school and then when it got to my parents generation finally they were able to start going to, to really going to school and getting careers for the first time so I am 
in my family, I am the first generation that's outside of slavery and Jim Crow. And I'm only 42, okay? So this is the first time my family has really been like, we're not completely free, but we got, we got a little bit more, right? So, so many of my aunts and uncles and my mother became teachers. Um, and when I showed an interest in science, I got that from my dad because he, we would sit outside and he would just like be, look, just be still, just watch the birds, notice the migration patterns, notice this. And they let me turn the dining room into a science lab, um, except on special occasions, you know, mama, you gotta, mama needs your dining room. And then we went to the library almost every week or we went to museums to supplement my education so that I could get, I could do experiments with groceries so, because we, we didn't, we didn't have the lab equipment, right? But so again, no one. I grew up thinking I could be a scientist, but because everyone around me was like, "You like science? Keep going." Um, and when I got to grad school and I started to encounter some of that prejudice, it was too late because my parents had already fulfilled in me that one, education is wonderful, and we will get it, an education. And two, you like science? You 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 absolutely can do it. That is so amazing. I love hearing the support that both of you had from your families and your parents. That's just absolutely incredible and just shows why you have the drive that you all have to make a difference in your communities. I was wondering what have you experienced that has been the biggest barrier to your leadership? And Dr. Unseld, you can go ahead. For me, it'll be two. One, is that that whole angry black woman stereotype like we're not allowed to show emotions um whereas right now i'm just kind of like no i have every right to be angry right I and mean, i have every right to feel every emotion just as every human being does and then two younger white men with less education i absolutely have to battle them when i go into these spaces even if they say they're progressive or you know they're not racist for some, they do not like me coming into a space and heaven forbid I tell them what to do. Or that I say, actually, you know, like I have more expertise. I've gone to conferences and they tried to talk to me and I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I already presented at this conference. Um, so it's, it's, the, it's the younger white men who seem to just not want to accept a black woman having any sort of authority. And then of course, the fact that if we do have too much emotions, I'm labeled angry. If I have too much, I'll get shot by the police or arrested. So it's navigating those things. Absolutely. Ms. Nwachuku. Okay. As a legislator, my core duty is lawmaking, representation, and the oversight of the executive. My biggest challenge in the my biggest challenge is over expectation from my constituents, resulting from their lack of understanding of my key role and responsibility as a legislator. I am just a lawmaker. Um, unfortunately, these constituents have been neglected over time. For a long time, the government care not about my community. We were neglected. So once they see someone in, in, go, in the uh, 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 House of Assembly, they think they have the governor with them. They think you can do everything. You, they think you can give them all they require and everything they need to address all their challenges. I try to network with relevant government officials also although these efforts are never adequate. Also, as a female legislator, I have to work harder and more diligently than my male counterparts. There are situations that I, I face discrimination and violence because of my gender. Another challenge is lack of adequate funding to support more women and young girls to be politically and economically empowered and independent. I could not implement my plans to mentor more women for some elective uh, positions like I planned initially, but I'm trying my best. I think these are the challenges I've had so far. Thank you. Thank you both for 
really vulnerable answers and feeling open enough to discuss um, in such a candid and really open up to us about your experiences and your challenges. I, from the bottom of my heart, I'm very grateful for both of you that you're here. Um, and, you know, I guess something that both of you guys hit on during your, during your answers to the previous question was about representation and how you're both really in spaces that do not encourage you to, or do not encourage, um, do not encourage you, I'll say that. So could you talk about a little bit of why representation matters as much as it does? And Ms. Wachuku, I will ask you first. Representation, sorry. Yes, why That's represent, why... yes. Why representation yes. matters in the workplace or in politics in your case? Yeah, representation matters a lot. In the House of Assembly, we were elected to represent your constituency. And then whatever you do, because politics is local, and whatever you do, you have to have it in mind that you are representing some people. You are not there on your own. So you work hand in hand. Every decision you discuss with your constituents, you seek their opinion. They are, because they are the ones, you are just like a servant, you have gone to work for people. So what you do in the house, whatever decision before you take it, you must discuss with the stakeholders. You get back to them, you tell them, look at what and what is happening. They give you their own ideas and how to present the matter because it is their matter you are representing. And it's very important you walk to the grassroots with your constituents. Take their opinion before you take any decision. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Unsell, would you like to share? Uh, yeah, so I have, in my mind, I think of it in two different ways. And the first way is, um, is talking about grassroots, right? So here, some of my friends and colleagues wrote something called the Jemez Principles for Democratic Organizing. These were black and brown environmental justice organizers. And there's six uh, principles, but an, a brief bad summary is that the community is the experts, the community speaks for itself. And that sort of highlights, you have to talk to grassroots, you have to talk to communities because if they know the problems, they're closest to the problems, they have ideas about what needs to be done. They can even say you need to look at the issue this way, or you know, because a lot of times I think, especially um, in the sciences, we we act as saviors. Now we say no, we don't need to be saved. We need resources um, and access to power, and that gets to like the other form of representation. So on the one hand, we're representing ourselves, our communities, our ancestors, but on the other hand, if we're going into predominantly white male spaces, representation is nothing anymore because it's always just been a marketing thing. They put black people on the poster and the com I've been in commercials. They're like, oh, she's the black faculty. And, and then, but they treat you horribly. So that's when we're saying that form of representation that, that, that has been manipulated for marketing purposes is no longer acceptable. So not only do we need to be in the room, we need to have decision-making capabilities. We need to have veto power. We need to have resources and everything else. So don't just invite me to your, you know, your country club or whatever, just to say you admitted a black woman. Um, it means I actually have, we actually have some say in what's going on. So on one hand, representation is good. On the other hand, it's been so manipulated um, by those in power that it, they re it's really lost meaning because they, they just kind of ruined it. I think uh, just to jump in, um, I completely agree with you. I think that a lot of times we talk about diversity, but we don't talk about inclusion. Um, and, you know, just like you said, you know, if there's a seat at the table, if, but without any speaking power, then that diversity is just for show. Um, so I just really wanted to jump in and really agree with you on that point because I could not have said it better myself. So thank you. Um, and you know, on that topic, I'll just 
jump in with, you know, what is, you talked a little bit about this, Dr. Unseld, but could you talk about what diversity and inclusion would ideally look like in the workplace for you? Some people have got to lose their jobs and some institutions cannot be reformed. They need to be destroyed uh, because oppression is just racism, sexism, misogyny. It's so built into some of these um, institutions and traditions that we can't reform them. You've got to just tear it down and start over. Um, so I think, could you, <laughs> could you ask the question again? <laughs> Absolutely. So I guess what does an ideal diverse and inclusive workplace look like to you? Uh, for me, it would be no more first of this is the first black woman to do this, right? Like there should have been a black woman on the Supreme Court a long time ago, right? We've been here 400 plus years, which we should have been on the court. Um, and also again, back to the Hemez principles and grassroots, those who most identify with the, pro the problem and are disproportionately impacted have leadership roles. So don't show me of how you've hired more diverse staff, but your board of directors is all white men, right? So here there was a black maternal health group. I was the only black woman there. I don't have kids. And so I said, you guys have got to stop everything and start over by talking to black women and black mothers and black doulas and black midwives in order to learn. It's just that idea of, we already know what needs to be done. We just, just, I hate to say this, but like give us the money and get out of our way, right? We know, we've kept ourselves alive this long, we're good. Yeah, that would be to me. And, in, and one where everyone feels safe feel safe to be fully human, be emotional, get angry, and to say like, maybe I am smarter than you and I will not get in trouble for that. I, you know, I'm over here snapping alongside <laughs> of you a little bit. I completely agree with you. I think that an inclusive workplace is a place where people are allowed to have emotions and they're allowed to be who they are and feel safe. That's, you know, something that I think anyone would want in their workplace. Um, and, you know, Miss Wachuku, could you talk a little bit about maybe what diversity and inclusion would be ideally for you in politics or within your workspace? Uh, I think the word inclusive, because we don't have um, the same background. We don't have a uh, racism here. We are more like one family here. The only issue where I have problem with inclusiveness is with the area of carrying women along. We have a lot of issues in Nigeria that has to do that borders around discrimination in the part of on the part of women. Women are being neglected and not being included at all in most of the things we have to fight to get what we want because of the patriarchy. Right? That type of um, um, culture we have, our tradition does not encourage women to be what they want to be. We are more suppressed than accepted in the society. So we fight to get everything we want. So that's my idea of inclusive, to be carry women along, recognize us like you do for the men, because we all have equal rights. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing the, those um, aspects of your girl's career and just how you've, how an ideal world would look, because I know obviously that's what we're all fighting for, especially leaders in our community. Um, on the subject of some things that you've been fighting for, what are some triumphs that you have had in your careers and some, some, some wins, I guess? Dr. Ansari. Sorry, go ahead. Is that for me? Yes, you can go ahead. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. I think the biggest trial I've had is uh, sponsoring two bills within my tenure of three years in office. I sponsored two bills. The first one has been passed already into law, and the second one 
is in progress. It has passed the first stage and the second stage and the third reading. So soon, I hope, it's going to pass through the third reading and then pass into law. So the first one is a bill for a law to amend the, the Rural Water Supplies and Sanitation Agency to give them the power to stand as an agency legally recognized. That's the first law. And I'm happy it has been passed because women are suffering a lot going about looking for water. So now that the legal backing has been given to the agency in charge of water, they will be able to provide these for people, for women especially. That's what I care about. Women who go about fetching this water for their family. And the second uh, uh, bill is a prohibition of fraudulent practices on land and property bill. Because this one is a very sensitive matter. Many people have died in the struggle for land grabbing. And it's not a good thing. But once it is a, uh, the, the issue is a, made a criminal matter, I think it's to put an end to all those problems. And then the third uh, trial is setting up some young women to become financially independent and then show they cater for themselves. To ensure they cater for themselves. These are the things I have achieved so far. And I'm very happy I've been able to get that done. Thank you. That is absolutely awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. I love that your work not only empowers women to be in leadership, but also looks at the issues that are facing women in your country and actively seeking to, to make change there. I love that. And thank you so much for the work that you're doing. Um, Dr. Ansel, what are some of your triumphs that you've had? I'm just so happy about everything she said. That's awesome. Thank you. Uh, because a lot of, one of my triumphs have been in sort of the intersection of science and policy. Um, so I think we hear more politicians and people who are doing community organizing and protesting, we're, uh, we're normalizing the use of data and research and saying, you know, the data set that they're using, you're currently using is not good because it assumes all of these things about black people and women that are not true. So we need new data or here's some different data that we need to collect. And maybe that will help us solve the problems. So recently I was um, put on an environmental protection agency committee about uh, a screening methodology for toxic chemicals. So that's a lot, I do a lot of work with toxic chemicals, environmental justice communities, which predominantly are black and brown, um, lower economic class and predominantly women who are impacted by like, climate change and, and toxic chemicals. And so we're working, we have one campaign going on now to get Johnson & Johnson to stop selling uh, talc baby powder on the global market. They are stopped, they're not selling it here in the US and Canada because of the lawsuits and it's got asbestos and it causes cancer. They admitted that they uh, targeted black women in their commercials. And now they're still gonna sell it in Asia, Africa and Latin America. And we're like, absolutely not. Um, uh, so we're pushing Vanguard there. We're pushing their shareholders to do that. Um, we're looking at a safer beauty campaign because a lot of the beauty products have toxic chemicals. Um, and then again, like the chemical facilities, because they put these facilities in black neighborhoods and near black schools and it's leaching poisons and we know it's changing brain development and we know that they can explode. So continued work on there, being on the EPA panel, seeing more politicians call out the need for data and also pushing scientists to say that we need to speak up more, um, particularly because globally, black and brown women have been sounding the alarm on these issues for decades. And sometimes they're killed for it, but then we wait until a little white girl from Europe starts saying the same thing. And now scientists are rushing to the streets when I'm like, I've got a long list of black and brown women who have been martyred um, for saying the same thing, right? So pushing back against science and saying, look, we need to be more inclusive. And when black and brown women are saying, hey, this drought's not going away, we need to accept what they're saying just as much as we would accept a little white girl from Europe. Um, so those have been my challenges because I kind of 
I kind of like my reputation of being that scientist who's going to come to the conference and be like, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, I don't like talk to black women because uh, we know, right? Like I said, give us the money and get out of our way. <laughs> to put it bluntly. <laughs> I love the bluntness. I think, you know, sometimes when we get caught in kind of saying things in such a a, rhetor a way with rhetoric that the meaning sometimes get lost, gets lost. Yeah. So I yeah. really appreciate your candor and you're being like, no, this is exactly what needs to happen and yeah. listen to black women. I 100% agree with well, you. The, the fact that we say it's an acceptable risk, which means you're, it's okay for someone to get sick or someone to die or it's okay for someone in South, Af South Africa to get cancer getting talc out of the ground. And I'm thinking, I said, that's what you're really saying here. It's, it's like, well, it's okay for someone in South Africa to die. So you, you can put on this powder. Um, and so just kind of pushing people to be completely honest to say, no terminology, give me the name of the person who needs to die so that you can have your, your car, right? Yeah. Cause it's usually someone who's got some more melanin and I'm kind of like, and I, and I also will say that I, I tend to not say the term minority um, because people of color are the people of the global majority. Um, and then even here in the United States, the, the people who are native to this land are brown. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you're shocked at seeing white people, like, what do you mean Charlize Theron? What do you mean she's from Africa? then maybe we should be just as shocked at seeing white people here, right? Because I know my ancestors aren't from here. So I, people of the global majority, because we really are, and to say we're a minority, kind of, it kind of pushes us to the side of that category of other. Um, so I just wanted to flag that. because, um, And also white people are not going to be the majority in the United States very soon. And I know some of y'all people are getting mad, but oh well, make America brown again. <laughs> so, I, mean, I mean it was brown this is this is brown people right my people didn't want to be here we were chilling y'all forced us this is brown people this is native american they were brown not white yeah i'm Absolutely. sorry <laughs> oh you're all good i think it's actually it connects to something that miss wachiku said earlier when we were talking about you know talk talking about, I guess, diversity is, she was like, we don't have the same background. My, you know, my background is with being a woman in politics and that's the area where I'm focusing on. And so I think that, especially when we're having these international conversations that the script and the narrative that we follow in the US does not apply everywhere else. In the majority of places, it does not apply. And like making sure that, and I appreciate your note about using the use of the word minority. And I really do appreciate that. Um, because I think it's important to make sure that we are using, you know, language and being explicit about what we're talking about and about these issues. So yeah, thank you. When, so when the U.S. bombs somebody, we're freeing them, right? And you're like, well, they're, they, we blew them up. They're not free, right? <laughs> like, because we blew them up. But yeah, so we have to be careful. Like, I try to be like very intentional with what we're saying because I think in the United States, we do tend to think that our narrative is traditional. Like mm -hmm. they didn't even realize that like black American culture still has quite a bit of Af West African culture in it. And white people were like, wait, what? You aren't assimilated? And you're like, nope, you know, we, we talk, you know. <laughs> but I think I would love to hear, can, we, can I ask uh, Lillian a question? Absolutely, that's exactly where I was gonna segue to. Okay. So thank you. I would love to know, like, what's it like to grow up knowing that your skin color was not something that could get you killed? And I mean that sincerely, because I mean, like, that just seems like such a fantasy to me to be able to wake up and, like, walk out of the house and be like, nobody's going to shoot me because of my skin color, which I'm laughing, but I'm like, I think it's like laughing through the trauma. Um, I'm actually very sorry about the, what they are passing through over there. Um, to us here, um, I've never had any such experience. I'm quite surprised to hear all this. 
and I feel so bad that you are passing through such. Um, it shouldn't be so. We are one. I know both black, both white. I I see everyone as one. And uh, even the the whites that are here with us here, we 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 embrace them so much, like we are family. There is no discrimination at all. We we are like one family. I'm really sorry to hear all this. It oh, no. makes me feel very much. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to make you feel sad. I just think because I feel like my leadership came out of so much is rooted in struggle. Right. And I know you have, but I just wonder, like, that's like one less struggle. And it just seems it really does seem like this, like, fairy tale land of like, wow. I, I can I can feel the way you I, I, I already have idea of what it is like. It's not easy. I know, but you are a strong woman. <laughs> and I know you can be. And uh, OK. One more question, because I'm just fascinated by you. I think you're so awesome. Um, I tend to work with a lot of politicians on how to ask for data. So if you ever want to like, you know, because sometimes you just need like to cite another researcher to get someone to say, no, this is why this policy works, right? And this is why you need to pass this, this bill, because it's like a mix. You have like, a, you have the numbers and the emotions behind it to say like, um, so yeah, if you ever want to hook up and like work together on something, I would that. You're asking, you're asking how I can, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, your question is um, how we get data for bills, right? Well, yeah, well, if you wanted me Am to I help correct? you like find some data or oh, say that, like, that, just so I you will. can maybe get your bills passed. I'm, I'm very much open to, I, I normally ask people if you have any bill that will be beneficial to all, please send it down. I will sponsor it and make sure it goes through. It's not true. That's my job. So long as I go through the bill and it's okay for us, it's going to encourage women, it's going to uh, make our lives, make differences in our lives. I'm okay. I'm open. I love that. I will accept it. I would, in fact, I want to have the uh, to connect very much with you so that if there are that task you can get to me i'm okay i will sponsor the bill yeah yeah because I, I i really think running for office is one of the most courageous things someone can do right like that like i, I don't think people appreciate how brave and how mentally tough and strong and how much you have to love your community to do that um so I always, I have two friends running for mayor here. And so I'm sending them data so like they can prepare for debates or if they wanna look at a housing policy, I can say like, no, this is this has been a problem. Like, this is what we've tried. This is what's not working. Um, but again, I always try to stick with, you know, supporting what people who are already there, you know, see as best. Cause like, I can't, I don't live there. I can't come in there and tell you what to do. And if I did, you should tell me to go sit down somewhere. But um, I would be honored because I just think you're awesome. I'm like fangirling out on your chat. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think you're awesome. Sorry. I'm over here fangirling over both of you. So don't even worry about it. <laughs> yeah, I just people who are as brave like that. I'm like, yo, like, seriously, not me, not I said Monica. <laughs> you can try, you can try. I'm encouraging you, you can try. Yeah, my it's uncle good. was on city right. council. I don't, I, 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 I don't think, I think I, I get too anxious and I would be like in the meeting like, ah. or it's like if I'm at my computer, or I'm doing like nerd stuff, you know, reading in the library, but like making a law, like for real? <laughs> no. <laughs> so you're, I, yeah, just know that you have a fan in me. Um, and even if you ever emailed me, I would probably freak out with like thinking that's cool. <laughs> I love this little like friendship that you guys are forming. I'm just, I'm really here for it and I love it. I was like, oh my gosh, she's like in public office. Like that's like, I, I could never. <laughs> no, ma'am. <laughs> I mean, you know, Miss Wachuku is 
Dr. Unseld is fangirling over here. Do you have any questions for her? <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. I like derailed the conversation. You are all good. I love it. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. But I, I think if anyone watches this, like run, if you have the courage, to, like so, she's ran for office, like you can do it, right? Like, man. <laughs> And then you can get somebody like me to send you some data over email or something. <laughs> and each time I come across women, I try to encourage them to run. Yeah. I talk yeah. them into running, even when they don't want to. I will <laughs> encourage them. I will push them. <laughs> and then I just have succeeded in pushing three women. For now, they're already occupying public office, offices. And then in the forthcoming election in 2023, I've told as many women as can to come. Let us go out there and run. We can't leave it for all these men because no man can protect the interests of women more than a woman. We know our problem, they don't. And that is what we have to fight to recover what we have lost all these years with men dominating. No, we don't want it anymore. To me, women are better leaders than men. So I want women to come out and take up these positions. Oh, I just love this so much. Like I just- so, Yeah, she's so, you're so <laughs> inspired. You are like, it's freaking me out. Cause I'm like, I agree. You know, even we had a discussion last month for International Women's Day with Chief Amy Hess and Miss Kiara Luis Seto, and it specifically talked about, you know, women in International Women's Month. And one of the things that was said during that conversation was about how important it is for when you get to a position that you're pulling people with you. Some, you know, like you were saying, you're like, they don't even want to run, but I'm going to pull them anyways. And I'm going to get them to run. And I think that's such an important point to, to really hit on there. And that's really selfless if you think about it. Right. You know, cause some people might just want to be like, I will be dictator. Right. And cause I guess that's probably the norm here in the States. Right. But <laughs> people get power hungry and they never leave office. Um, but thank you, that's very selfless to, to, to bring others. And I think that's beautiful. That's it's just so beautiful. And it shows like how much she cares like, and that she's good at it, right? I'm talking to her like she's, like, she's not here, sorry. It's not like <laughs> my parents talk about me. I'm like, I'm here, mama, I'm right here. <laughs> Sure. And Ms. Wachuku, do you have any questions for Dr. Unsell before we close out? No, for now. For now. All right. Well, I mean, this has been just the most amazing discussion. Um, you guys are contributing such valuable statements on leadership. And thank you for being so vulnerable with us and talking about, you know, the violence that you're experiencing and trauma and really acknowledge both acknowledging that and speaking about it in such an eloquent, but immediate way. I think that that's just, thank you so much for that. I could not have asked for um, anything else really. Is there, you know, before we wind down and close down this discussion, is there any final words that either one of you guys would like to, to leave us with? Well, I, I will tell you something I always tell young people, never let anyone convince you that you are not the expert in your life, right? So stand firm that you know what you do and that you have something valuable to bring to whatever it is you do in life. Thank you so much. That means a lot, so thank That's you. That's the professor talking. <laughs> <laughs> and Ms. Wachuku, any final words? Yeah, the... The, the, what I want to say is that there is an urgent need to address the abnormalities of minority and underrepresentation for equity, inclusiveness, and equality. Very important. To me, it's a matter of urgency 
public attention. Thank you. Thank you. I, you know, I think that's why we have the conversations and why it was one of the particular conversations I wanted to be able to have with this series is to bring that, you know, that public attention and that like, we're going to talk about this in the light. We're not going to talk about it in a behind behind a closed door. We're going to bring this to light and we're going to talk about it in a frank and you know, really beautiful way. So thank you both again for your participation today. I just am so grateful that I got to meet you both and I'm gonna leave this conversation so inspired and I hope that anyone else that watches it leaves just as inspired as we are. So, all right, thank you all again for being here. I think we're gonna go ahead and stop recording.